Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to my part of the neighborhood, and you're going above ground, so that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. My home is adorned by the flag, and that has been my home since 1864. I was born in 1825 in, in and near Belfast, Ireland. My parents, Matthew and Catherine, immigrated to Canada, and from Canada, somehow found their way to the Ohio Valley. There they bought a farm near St. Clairsville, Ohio. And as I grew up there, I thought farming, I had other more important things to do than sun up to sun down farm. And I had to find a way to get out of it. So a nearby physician in Morristown, Ohio, his name was Dr. Ephraim Gaston. And Dr. Gaston, when I was in my early teens, gave me materials to read, most of it on medicine. That encouraged me to maybe pursue medicine. So on my 18th birthday, he helped me enter the Sterling College, Sterling College of Medicine in Columbus, Ohio. I graduated from there in 1849 and took up a brief practice of medicine in Brownsville, Pennsylvania. Well, I was looking for a more, more prestigious office, more prestigious position in the field of medicine. The opportunity came in Columbus, back, took, that took me back to Columbus, Ohio, where I became the top assistant to Dr. Joseph Hall at the Ohio Lunatic Asylum. <laughs> so at the Lunatic Asylum, I went ahead, practiced my trade, and kind of understood Dr. Hall's position, that everybody who commits a crime, there might be some other outstanding reasons other than ordinary behavior. So he said, maybe there's some people who have some mental illness that is treatable. So the Ohio Lunatic Asylum opened and I became his top assistant. And everyone was curious about his practices and his results. And uh, he was not ashamed to be a little on a bragging edge. And he said, when he was asked, how is your treatments going? How are your patients? He says, how are the results? 100% cured. 100% cured. So reporters, when they went to go ahead and research his findings, the reporter would come back and one of the partners in the office would say, well, how's things at the asylum? He says, all is well. All is well. So his name became synonymous with that in the reporter's office. All right, and I returned after a short stay there another turn in my life, brought me to Wheeling, Virginia. And I started practicing and living in Wheeling, 1851. By 1853, I had married a sweetheart from Martinsbury, Ohio. We were married in Martinsbury in 1853, lived and raised four children in Wheeling. Also in the 1850s, politics started to turn and politics in the United States. The idea of sections of our country, looking at ideas on taxes, states' rights, and slavery, started to create a separation. There are compromises to prevent war between its states breaking away from the Union through 1850, 1853, and by 1854, another party comes on the scene. Anybody know the name of that party? political party comes on, involves in 1854, the Republican Party, right? As the Republican Party grew, talking about union, in the, in the, the expansion of slavery, talk about taxes, the South, Southern, some Southern states started to get a little irritated. And they became more irritated when an attorney from Springfield, Illinois, was elected president. That's Lincoln, of course. In 1860, South Carolina was secede. It was elected in November. South Carolina secedes in 1860 because it's official. Anyone know why? Why is it official in December? That's my teaching coming out. <laughs> Electoral College counts the votes. Okay? And Electoral College, Lincoln is elected president. That month, South Carolina will secede. 
In April 1861, they fired uh, federal or union, uh, Confederate troops under one of my favorite names, Pierre Gustave Toussaint Beauregard, fires on Fort Sumter. Lincoln calls for volunteers. I will volunteer. My heart's with the Union. My services are going to be with the Union. So I enlist in the 1st Virginia under Benjamin Kelly. Our first assignment is to guard the Pabino Railroad in Philby, Virginia. There comes the first land battle of the Civil War. Not the major, but the first land battle. And it wasn't much of a battle. The rebels come in to take over the railroad, take control of the railroad. First Virginia is there, fire a few times, and the rebels spread it out of town, seeing who can be the first to get out of town. Union soldiers joked about it and says, there it is, the Philippi races. The Confederates skedaddled so fast, they outrun one another to get out. Well, it was more than just the three months that I signed up that the war would take place. After three months, the first Virginia reorganized, and I will become a colonel. I will serve under Philip Sheridan, who is commander of the Army of the Shenandoah Cavalry. I serve as a surgeon, not only to Kelly when he is wounded and his body brought back to Wheeling, I will continue serving as a surgeon and become a colonel in a division of the 8th Corps of Sheridan's Okay, as time went on, the Union had to see the small battles, but take away the bread basket, take away their food supply, take away the route that ran from north to south. Protecting the Shenandoah Valley from Martinsburg, Virginia, to Winchester, Virginia, was the Army of Virginia under Jubal Early. Jubal Early only had 12,000 men, and he knew he was going to go up to Phil Sheridan's Army of, Shenandoah, of the Shenandoah. And we had 40,000 men. But Early was confident that he could stretch a thin line protecting the areas of Martinsburg as well as Winchester. Two important points and make sure that line stretches. 12,000 men, that's about 20 miles. So that's a pretty thin line. Sheridan had a game plan of going ahead and plan to attack. Confederate left, okay, which I commanded that outfit to attack the Confederate left. The Confederate right would be attack its flank and front the middle, all at the same time. Well, Early's line bent, 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 and they forced out of that part of the Shenandoah Valley, but it wasn't a major victory. We had to regroup, and we regrouped near Middleburg and Winchester. Early was going to plan an attack, okay? The first battle was called Oppican, Battle of Oppican, September 19th, 1864. And that's a major turning point. That's a major turning point in the Shenandoah Valley fighting, right? But it didn't give us a complete victory. So Early launches an attack on the early morning of October, one month, exactly one month later, October 19th, 1864. He launches an attack. Bill Sheridan, our commanding officer, is at a meeting in Washington, D.C. On his way back, he is shocked to see his men in the early morning being chased from their tents, carrying their rifles in their underwear. They're running out towards Middleburg, Middletown, and they're in their underwear, skedaddling away from the Confederate Army, from Jubal's infantry. Well, they see Sheridan, they let out a cheer, and their mental attitude changes. He gives his commanding officers orders to turn around and counterattack. The counterattack works. Jubal Early's army is defeated. The Union takes command of that part of the Shenandoah Valley, gaining Winchester, Martinsburg, Harper's Ferry area, and it's a victory, a major victory for the Union. But also on that day, on October 19, 1864, I'll be fired upon by someone wearing the same colors I am. 
it's a Confederate spy they found out. Hear better. Mortally wounded by a Confederate spy picking me out, targeting me, and assassinating me. My body will be back, brought back here in 1864, and a parade, as I mentioned before, will be brought up Main Street and will be at my resting place. 32 years later, my wife will be buried here. My four children, Anne, Mary, Joseph, and Catherine, will live on, and my oldest in the family will live until 1936. So briefly, that's the story of Joseph Thobar. And if you have any questions, I'm glad to entertain you.